We do come now to God's Word. We're continuing forward in our series in Luke's Gospel. Uh, This morning we are in Luke chapter 9. We are continuing forward in verses 23 through 27. Particular focus this morning will be on verses 25 through 27. This is uh, part two of our uh, sermon on, on these verses here. So if you would direct your attention to Luke chapter, 20, uh, chapter 9, verses 23 through 27, we'll read that again together. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's word. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes and his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, as we come now to your word, we ask that you would do a work of grace in our hearts by your spirit. That you would show us Christ. He would show us that the surpassing worth, the surpassing gain of following him, of, of following him on the costly path of discipleship. Open our hearts, Father, to hear words. Give us hearts to, to receive. Give us eyes to see. Allow us to live out of this passage. Lord, would you speak, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. It's being called the great de-churching. One article estimates that 40 million adults, or 16% of the American population, 40 million American adults used to go to church but no longer do. For the first time in eight decades that Gallup has tracked American religious membership, more adults in the United States don't attend church than attend church. The article goes on to say that as a nation, we're currently experiencing the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of the United States. Tens of millions of formerly regular Christian worshipers nationwide have decided they no longer desire to attend church at all. These are what we now call the de-churched. More and more people are talking about and books are being written about this reality about why people aren't coming back to church. And bloggers and theologians and sociologists, they have all sorts of complicated ideas for why this is happening. But at a certain level, the answer is relatively simple. Why aren't people coming back to church? Because they don't want to. Increasingly in our day and age, people do not see the value of eternal things. And so they've they've chosen to give themselves over to what they actually value, what they actually love, what they've actually wanted all along, the world and all of its pleasures. You see, the great de-churching that we've seen in America has not coincided with some profound period of persecution that's driven people away. In fact, as church attendance has dropped off of a cliff since 1990, the per capita income of Americans has more than doubled. You see, it's not the adversity that has most affected the church of Jesus Christ. It's prosperity. We live in a culture in which so many people, so many so-called Christians are doing all that they can, everything that they can to gain the world only to forfeit their souls. And this is the warning of Christ here in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 27. As we continue forward in this passage this morning, we see Christ warning his people about the danger of this, the danger of chasing after the world. He's warning them of the great cost of gaining the world. Yes, you can gain the world, but it will cost you your life. Now, before you tune out this morning, perhaps think I'm talking about somebody else because you're here. 
You're at church. You're not de church. You're not unchurched. Perhaps you're one of the good guys. What could this passage mean for us gathered here today? What could it say to you? Well, Christ, we need to understand what Christ is saying here. He's speaking to the heart of his people. Because he knows that way before people will forsake him outwardly, they will forsake him inwardly in their hearts. And so he's warning his people about the heart condition of valuing the world, of chasing after the world, of desiring the world more than him and his kingdom, of valuing temporary things more than eternal things. He wants us to be very clear to see very clearly the great eternal cost of gaining the world and be persuaded in our hearts that to forsake the world and to follow Christ is infinitely better. So let's continue to count the cost together as we work our way through the rest of this passage. Last week we saw in verse 23 that the cost of following Christ, yes, it is great. There is a cost to discipleship. Our obsession with ourselves, our idea of the good life, they have to die. The cost is great. But it's nothing compared to the cost of gaining the world. That's what we'll see this morning. Yes, the cost of following Christ is great, but it's nothing compared to the cost of gaining the world. Look back at verses 24 through 25. Christ continues... For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Christ warns us here. He warns us that our obsession with ourselves, our obsession with the good life now, comes at a tremendous cost. That to try to cling to, to hold on to, to save our version of the good life, to, to try to squeeze every last drop of fulfillment out of this life will lead to, lead to us actually losing the only life that matters. For whoever would save his life will lose it. To say it another way, you can choose between life now or life forever. You can choose between temporary joy or eternal, unending joy. That's what Christ means here when he uses the term, the world. Maybe you've always wondered what that means, what that term, the world, means. Well, the world simply refers to this temporary, physical reality in which we live. This fallen reality that's passing away. That's what Christ means here when he refers to the world. And he's saying that to gain this world means to gain temporary things that will only ever pass away. You see, you can spend your entire life chasing the pleasures of this world. And at the end of that, you will have nothing to show for it. It's all passing away you cannot take it with you. You will have tried so hard with a white knuckle grip to save your life, only to lose it. This is the warning of Christ again in verse 25. What does it profit a man? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Here's the analysis that Christ is making here. In order to gain the world, it will cost you your life. And why is that? Because to gain the world, to trust in the world, to chase after the world, you must reject Christ and his gospel. There is no eternal life. There is no salvation outside of that offered to us in and through Jesus Christ. And as Christ says here, that's a bad business decision. There is no profit to be found in gaining and holding on to temporary earthly things at the expense of your eternal soul. There's no profit to be found of gaining this entire world only to forfeit eternal life. But here's the problem. We've heard this verse and these verses so many times as evangelical Christians we grow so numb to them. We think perhaps that Christ is talking to other people, all the rich billionaires out there. He couldn't possibly be talking to us. We don't take this verse 
as seriously as we should. We do our best to, to try to wriggle out of it in our minds. Christ says here, you cannot uh, inherit eternal life and also gain the world. And so much of modern Christianity seems to say to us, of course you can. Yes, you can. You could have it both ways. God wants you to have your best life now. And in fact, Jesus is the way to get all the things of the world, all the things you really want. Jesus is the way to get those. You can follow Jesus and still have the world and all of its pleasures. In our day and age, we have grown so numb to the danger of the world. You know, if you go to Sumter and you take a walk around Swan Lake Park, you see a great example of this. I'm growing numb to danger. Whenever we go and we take a walk around that park, you, you see in these different grassy areas that the groundskeepers have put up these fake wolves and the different grassy areas in an attempt to keep the, the geese and the ducks and the swans away from the people. It's kind of funny because it does not work. <laughs> You see where the geese and the ducks and the swans are. They're, they're all nesting. They're all playing all around this fake wolf. Why? Because there's no danger. They've gotten wise. They, they've realized that there's no real danger in that wolf. Here's the, here's the difference for us as the people of God. The danger of the world is real. It's not fake. It's not pretend. And so we can do our best to go around and, and put, let our hearts go into a place where we think that we're going to be safe when we're actually not. We can do everything to chase after the world thinking that we're safe. We're actually putting ourselves into a place of supreme danger. When our hearts go to a place that Christ warns us not to, it's not silly, it, it's serious. In fact, it's eternally dangerous. Because here's the truth from God's word. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot give in to the self-exalting, self-obsessed, pleasure-seeking, worldly-minded age that we live in and still follow Jesus. Because following Jesus is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of what you desire, value, and trust in and love. Here's what Christ means here. You can't love all the things the world loves, value all the things the world values, invest all your time, all your energy into worldly things, and then just sprinkle some Christian flavoring on it and be eternally safe. You might say you're a Christian. You might sit in church your entire life. You might say you follow Jesus, but in your heart, at the level of what you actually desire and trust in, you're actually following the world. Just like Christ warned a few chapters ago, the world and its desires are like a weed. They're like a thorny plant that when sown in your heart, they begin to choke out the word of God at work. Here's the reality. Please understand this. Your, your heart cannot serve two masters. It will either hate the one or love the other. If it's in love with the world, it will reject Christ. We need to see this danger for what it is. If our hearts are committed to gaining the world, we will reject Christ. Why? Because as we just saw last week, what does Christ call us to when we decide to follow him? When we follow Jesus Christ, it requires, just as we saw last week, to abandon all hope in yourself. To abandon all hope in this world, to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. If you truly just want out of this life, if all you truly want is just happiness now, to gain the world, your heart will reject Christ. Your lips may honor him, all while your heart is far from him. This is the great danger. Facing the modern church, the prosperity of the world that causes us to reject Christ and his call to discipleship. This is what we're seeing in the church today and what's being called the great de-churching. 
So many people who have called themselves Christians are now walking away from Christ, are walking away from his church. Why? Because of the siren song of the world. Because the world has captured their hearts. They've chosen to trust in the world. It begins in your hearts, beloved. You can sit in a pew your entire life with a heart dead towards God and in love with the world. The D church are simply those who've expressed externally what was always going on internally. A rejection of Christ and his call to repentance and faith. And here's the great tragedy. As Christ says in verse 26, here is the seriousness of what we're dealing with. Verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You see, if you reject Christ at a heart level, if you're ashamed of him, if you're ashamed of his call to repent and believe the gospel, his call to follow him, his call to reject the world, if you reject Christ, he will reject you on the last day when he comes in glory to judge all things. Yes, the cost of following Christ is great. Self-denial, suffering, hardship. But it's nothing compared to the eternal, immeasurable cost of gaining the world, forfeiting eternal life, and being rejected by Christ. Where do you stand today, beloved? How are you functionally spending your life? What has your heart? What are you giving yourself to are you focused so much on earthly things or on eternal things? Are you functionally at a heart level seeking to gain the whole world at the expense of your eternal soul? If so, hear again this warning from J.C. Ryle. He preached on this passage some 200 years ago to his congregation. Hear this warning from him to his congregation. He writes, Ask the dying sinner. Stand by his bedside and inquire of him whether it proves a comfortable and supporting thought that he has cared more for the world than for his soul. Perhaps you've never saw the deathbed of one who has not got his feet upon the rock. Oh, it is a fearful, instructive, soul-moving sight when the heart begins to beat faintly and the eyes grow dim, when friends are weeping all around and human medicines avail no longer, when all the intoxication of worldly pleasures or business is past and far away, when each lies in his own silent chamber with nothing apparently between himself and God, when something whispers, you shall not come down from the bed in which you've gone up but shall surely die, in that solemn hour, beloved, we have little idea how small appears this earth and how broad eternity, how much the memory of sin improves, how deeply a guilty conscience darkens. You would then hear him acknowledge that his life had been a grand mistake. You would hear him confess that the care of his soul was indeed the one thing needful and bitterly repent the time he had lost, the opportunities he had neglected, and the instruction he had despised. And he ends with this, God grant that I may be spared the pain of seeing any of you in such a plight. Friends, if you are here today, there is still time. There is still time Today, if you hear the voice of Christ, do not harden your hearts. Repent and believe the gospel because there is a promise in this passage. Christ does not leave us in this warning. He does not leave us in this condemnation. Here is his promise to all who believe from verse 27. But I tell you truly, 
There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Here's what this means. Those who turn from their sin, who turn from their self-centeredness, who turn from the love of the world, who turn in faith to Christ as their Savior and Lord, who take up their cross and follow him, they are promised an inheritance in the kingdom of God. They're promised to see, to have a foretaste of the kingdom. And where will they see that? We know where the disciples will see that, certainly. They'll see that in the death and resurrection of Christ. That's what Christ is promising here to his disciples. It's what he's promising to all of us by faith. The disciples will see the glory of Christ's kingdom ushered in in his death and resurrection. All who come to Christ in faith are given the eyes to see and the hearts to receive the, the glory of Christ's rule and reign as king, demonstrated in his death for our sins and his resurrection in which he killed death. All who come to Christ in faith are given those new hearts to see the surpassing worth of Christ, the surpassing worth of Christ's eternal kingdom. You see, friends, true life comes from giving your life up, all of it, to Christ. Entrusting your life, yourself, to him completely, not just a, a little bit of your life on Sundays, all of it. <laughs> Following Jesus Christ, yes, it's costly, but it is the good life. The life of joy and peace in victory in Jesus forever. That's what Christ won for us. In his death and resurrection, Christ won the victory for us over the world, the flesh, and the devil. His kingdom that he ushered in is an eternal kingdom that will not end, and he is coming in glory. That's what he says here. He's coming in glory, in the glory of his Father, in the glory of his holy angels to judge all things. Ten billion years from now, when this world is long gone, Christ and his kingdom will endure. Don't waste your life now chasing after a world that's passing away. Place your faith in Christ and his eternal kingdom. Following Christ is always worth the cost. As the great missionary Jim Elliott once said, Several years before dying for his faith in South America, he was speared to death in the jungles of Ecuador. He never lived to be my age. He was 28. He left a young wife, a one-year-old daughter. Some people might call that a waste. Here's what he wrote in his journal a few years before he died. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. If you're familiar with the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, you'll remember well the, the words of Christian, the main character in John Bunyan's allegory on the Christian life as he's beginning on his journey from the city of destruction, this world, to the celestial city, the new heavens and the new earth. As he's about to leave on this journey, the people of the city of destruction try to stop him. They ask him, why are you leaving all of your friends, all of your family? Why are you forsaking all of the comforts of this world? Don't you understand all of what you're giving up? I'll leave you with Christian's reply. He says, I seek an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, and it is laid up in heaven and safe there to be bestowed at the time appointed on them that diligently seek it. Oh, beloved, seek not the things of this world. Seek an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and laid up for you safe in heaven with Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, give us the eyes to see the surpassing worth of Christ the surpassing worth of his kingdom, which is coming. Oh, Father, help us. So often we're so worldly-minded, we're so earthly-minded, we cannot get beyond what we see. Give us the eyes to see, Father. 
the value of eternal things. Give us the eyes to see the, the eternal cost of, of giving our lives away to this world, of having our hearts hardened to Christ, of rejecting Christ and his call to discipleship. Oh, Father, help us see. Break our hearts. Cause us to reject this world, Lord, and to follow Christ, to seek after that inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, that is laid up in heaven with Christ. Amen and amen.